Hi, today's chapter is chapter two, and we're going to be talking about the brain primarily. Now, for those of you who are in the medical field, you're going to understand that you'll go into a lot more depth than this in your medical field. If you take AMP, you're going to go into far more depth than we're going to go here. For those of you who are not in the medical field, we're just going to go briefly through this chapter. This is not a very big chapter for the test. There are some things about the brain that you do need to understand as we move forward in psychology, because psychology is the study of remembering behaviors and mental processes and the mental processes are that of the brain so we want to make sure you have some basic information the first part of the brain that we talk about is the neurons now this picture right here you're going to see in your textbook and it's probably a lot clearer in your textbook than it is on this slide it's kind of small but neurons are the very small part and I love this picture right here because this picture is actually a real picture of the neurons within a brain we need a super really super microscope to be able to see these things but if you've ever heard of a neuro net this is a neuro net and it looks like a net it looks like we could catch a whole bunch of things going through there well first of all the neurons are basically a single cell of uh, the nervous system now this whole thing is a neuron it has many different pieces and so we need to understand a few pieces the first one is is that these little things right here they look like little sort of octopus legs those are our dendrites now in the middle of the dendrites or right in this area is the soma that's the heart of the neuron and we're going to be talking about that in a few minutes as far as electricity is concerned and coming out of the neuron is the axon and they branch over as you can see to the next neuron and that's those little lines that you see right there those are all axons and those axons are pretty important because they're sort of the highway you might want to say now the thing is is that the axon is a branch and it really kind of you look at the axon as being like the cabling system of the brain so think about the old system that we used to have for TVs which is still pretty much there if you have cable you're going to have a cable that runs from the cable company to your TV well that's sort of what happens here and you'll notice that this is a one-way kind of ride now what's important to understand is that within this neuron we have a couple of different systems that's working the big thing is is that within the neuron we have basically an electrical current call this as the action potential and within the neuron within that soma that you were looking at basically an electric current begins to develop and when that current gets high enough or this action potential gets there it basically shoots electricity down the axon now that that shot of electricity is really important because at the end of the axon is the synapses and as that electrical current and I'll make like little X's right there as that electrical current comes down it stimulates the creation of neurotransmitters now neurotransmitters are the chemical part of the brain and they're the ones that we talk about when we say somebody has a chemical imbalance that's what we're talking about are these little neurotransmitters so what you want to remember is that within the neuron we're using electricity between the neurons we've got basically chemicals and that chemical is pretty easy to remember it's called neurotransmitters because it's transmitting information from one neuron to the other neuron now notice that it kind of makes like a little bundle here and then they kind of begin to float across and they'll come to these receptor sites now this drawing is a little misrepresentational because it looks like all the receptor sites are the same but they're not what happens is that each neurotransmitter has a unique shape so some will be shaped like diamonds and some will be shaped like stars or whatever the different shapes are and the receptor site matches that shape and so only certain neurotransmitters will go into certain receptor sites so think about that old game when you were a kid and you were a little kid and you had that box and it had circles and stars and diamonds and you had these pieces and you had to get them in the right spot well basically that's what we're talking about here we have to have the right neurotransmitters going into the right spot for this all to work now neurotransmitters are really important because neurotransmitters basically set our mood it helps us remember things 
some of the major neurotransmitters that we'll talk about in class is dopamine, neopropane, and serotonin. Now, serotonin is the one I like the best because it makes you feel happy. It's the one that they always joke about that if you eat chocolate, you feel happy because it produces serotonin. Um, now, the reason that the other reason these neurotransmitters are so important is that if they're not chemically balanced, meaning that we don't have the right amount of different ones, then we will find that we may have brains that are in the depressed mode or we have may have brains that are in an overexcited mode. Neurotransmitters are what keep us balanced. Also, interestingly enough, is that when it comes to your memory, neurotransmitters are key to memory. We find that when you're making a memory, you have a certain number of neurotransmitters. And you might have, uh, I'm making this up, okay, 15 serotonins and three dopamines and two neuroprep. Uh, neuropropylenes, oh, which I cannot suddenly say. But anyway, those have to be in the right chemical mix. So that's what you have. You have 15, 2, and 2. Now, when I go to try to gain that memory back, I want to think about that. I actually have to have the same amount of neurotransmitters. I have to have 15, 2, and 2 again. It's like a key in a lock. If I don't have the right key, I can't open the lock. So if I don't have the right number of neurotransmitters, it's very hard for me to get that memory back. How I can explain that one to you is if you've ever been really pissed off, you can think about everything else that you were pissed off at the same time. It just comes right out. If you're really happy, sometimes you can think about all the other happy occasions you have. And when you're really happy, it's kind of hard to think about those pissed off things. And when you're pissed off, it's kind of hard to think about those happy things. Well, that's a great example of how your neurotransmitters have to be in the same balance in order for you to gain those memories back. This is going to become really important next week when we really start talking about memories. The other thing I want you to kind of have a good understanding of as you walk around, walk away, are sort of the parts of the central nervous system. Now, the central nervous system basically is a brain and a spinal cord. That's it. Just that nice little area here and the brain are the central nervous system. Now, that makes up nerves. And the nervous system is something that we talk about a lot. In fact, quite often you hear them raising money for diseases of the central nervous system. Well, if they're talking about the central nervous system, it has to be a disease that hits the brain or the spinal column. The other nervous system has everything else. So basically anything that's outside the brain or the spinal column is going to go into the next nervous system. Now, this nervous system is broken into two areas. We have this, the autotomic, let's do the autotomic nervous system first. That's the one that I tend to focus on a little bit more in class. This is the one that basically it controls all the automated things. It controls your organs, your glands, your heart rate, digestion. All of that is controlled automatically. If you think about it, you don't think about your heart beating, it just beats, but it's controlled by this autotomic nervous system. Everything else that basically is your muscles, your movement, um, voluntary control action, so if you raise your hand in class, that's going to come out of the atomic nervous system. So the autotomic nervous system is the one we don't control, the other one is the one we do control. Let's talk about the autotomic nervous system for a minute because we're going to talk about the sympathetic and the parasympathetic systems. You'll see this little diagram in your book also. Now these two systems are going to come to play when we start talking about the use of certain chemicals or drugs within the body systems, when we talk about excitement and other things. The sympathetic and the parasympathetic system kicks in. Now it's easy to remember which ones these are. Now remember, first of all, this comes out of the autotomic nervous system. So this is something I don't control. This is something my body controls. We have the sympathetic system and the sympathetic system it says it arouses. Well, how, are we, how I always remembered it is that the sympathetic system gets you started. So if somebody goes, boo, and scares you, you kind of get this rush all of a sudden of adrenaline. And that adrenaline begins this process occurring. It begins to dilate your poop, pupils. It begins to inhibit your tears. It relaxes your bladder. So quite often if you get scared, you suddenly find you need to go pee. You ever notice how a dog pees when it gets really excited? That's why. And there are several other things it does. It will release sugar from the liver. Now, why is it doing all this? Well, it's because of what's called the fight or flight system. Basically, if I get somebody who yells boo at me, I really don't know if you're a good guy or a bad guy. What I do know is that I might have to run right now and I may have to fight right now in order to keep myself alive. So I'm gearing my body up to do that. And that's one reason why we relax the bladder. If you think about it, how easy is it to run with a full bladder? 
<laughs> not so easy. So we'd rather just get rid of everything so we can completely control ourselves for this fight. Uh, the only problem is that your body evolved back when we were on the Great Plains of Africa. And our biggest fear we had was lions and tigers and bears. Oh my! Your body doesn't know the difference between a lion, tiger, bear and a math test. To it, a math test is just as scary as those other animals are. And so when it has adrenaline hit the system, it basically starts that sympathetic system. This may be why you find that you feel uncomfortable right when you get your test and all of a sudden you need to go to the bathroom or your eyes get really dry. You know, something happens because it basically is saying, hey, I'm under attack. Don't know what's attacking me, but I'm going to keep myself safe. And so your sympathetic system has got you all started. Now the other thing is that we can't stay in that heightened emotion for too long or that heightened body um, too long because that will begin to burn us out. So we need something to calm us down and that's where the parasympathetic system comes in right there. So if our sympathetic system is kicked up, our parasympathetic system will come and bring us back down. It sort of brings us back to level. So it's the one that after you've had that person go boo and you've kind of had your heart rate go up, then you kind of, uh, you kind of feel that down. That's your parasympathetic system kicking in. Basically between those two, they're going to completely control your bodies as far as if it's going to be in action or if it's going to be calmed down. Your body, if given a chance, would love to be in a very dull, nothing happening state most of the time. Now, we also will be talking about the brain and mental processes as we go through this um, course. And sometimes you wonder how we know these things. Well, first of all, we know things through different types of studies. And one of the biggest we'll talk about is clinical case studies. And basically, we'll use somebody who's got something that's injured their brain or in some way um, there was something different about their brain and while we can't go and do this specifically to somebody we can look and see what's happened to them afterwards so somebody um, who may have had a spike through the brain and yes we have had people who've had things go through their head we can't do it on purpose but we can see what happens afterwards the other thing we use a lot are these PET scans now what you see over here is a PET scan and what happens is that we basically have you consume a little glucose. Glucose is type of a sugar. It's got a little bit of radiation in it. Not enough that's going to kill you, but enough that it can light up the brain. And then we ask you to do an activity. So in this case, we're asking the people to see. Now the front of the head is this way. This is the back of the head here. And you'll notice that the back of the head area is where this is all lit up. That means is that when we're seeing, we tend to be using the back of our head. When you're hearing, you tend to be using the area of the brain that's sort of near your ears. Kind of makes sense. Speaking is sort of there in the middle. And notice that thinking is primarily in the front, but you know it's in other areas too. So when we talk about the actual use of the brain, and we said that the definition of psychology included mental processes, this is the type of stuff we're talking about. We can't study you actual thought patterns, but we can study what part of the brain you're using when you think. Now a couple of the things that we do when we're studying the brain is that we will use electronic stimulation of the brain. And basically this is an electrode. An electrode is something that's placed in the brain and a small electrical current is put in there. Now when we put the small electrical current in there it will stimulate the brain to act. This is really something that's done quite often when we're talking about Parkinson's disease. We may be going in and stimulating part of the brain to see what part of the brain we could perhaps um, sort of help stimulate so that we can get rid of some of that shaking that the Parkinson um, disease people have. We also may be doing this with people who have got other certain diseases or problems with the actual structure of their brain. Uh, we could also do a deep lesion. Unfortunately what a deep lesion is is when somebody has an area of the brain that um, needs to be destroyed. So we could have a cancer victim that might need this. Or again, quite often in Parkinson's, we might have to do a lesion, destroy a little area of the brain to try to help control the shaking and movements that we have. This has been a really interesting thing because when we do deep lesions or when we do most of these activities, you're actually awake. What they'll do is they'll knock you out to go ahead and open up your brain. But then once they've opened up the brain, they wake you up. And the reason they can do this is that we actually have no nerves in the brain. 
they are a bundle of nerves, but they themselves have no nerves. You can't feel us actually in your brain, functioning in your brain. So we need you to be awake so that we can find out what area of the brain that we're actually tapping into. So if they're going to be taking out part of the brain, let's say because of a tumor, they would like to see you know, what areas are going to be affected by taking that out. So they may have you talking or they may have you doing simple tasks to see what's going to happen as we touch those electronically with electricity. Because remember, it's electrical within the neuron and it's chemical between. So if we use a little electricity, we can stimulate those neurons to act. Now the last thing that I'm going to ask you to kind of learn and memorize, and this is a kind of a memorize or regurgitate thing, are the four lobes of the brain. We will talk about the four lobes of the brain as we go. And basically you got a big old brain mass here, nice and wrinkly and wiggly. And what we want to understand is that the back of the brain right here is the optical lobe, and that's basically where our vision is held. In the front of the brain, I always like hit my head to think, well, we can think about that. That's our frontal lobe, and it is where most of our higher mental processing happens, is where our reasoning and planning tends to occur. So sort of a lot of our thinking is here. Our temporal lobes, which are over there by our ears, that's where our hearing and language is, and that makes sense too, nice and convenient. On the top of the lobe, and this is how I always remember this because I can feel the sun shining on the top of my head, so basically this top parental lobe is where our sensations of touch and pressure, basically your feelings, not emotional feelings. No, I mean we're talking about your actual senses of feeling. All of that will tend to sit in that area. So for the test, I do want you to be able to understand what these four lobes are and the basic function of each lobe. So you'll see something like um, Neil is looking at a picture which lobe is now active and that would be of course that lobe back there. Well that's just a quick overview of chapter two and as I said this is a little kind of a thin chapter not going to do a whole lot in this chapter and I will see you in class.